that. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's get started. It's a special pleasure to have Tamar Zaki today as our speaker to close out the fluid seminar for this term. Uh, Tamar got his PhD from Stanford and then actually spent quite some years here at uh, Imperial in mechanical engineering as a faculty member before he took up his current position at uh, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. So it's uh, great to have you back. And uh, Tamar will tell us about accurate reconstruction of flow trajectories for incomplete turbulence data. Please, Tamar. Thank you, Peter and uh, Demetrius for the invitation. So it was a pleasure to come back to Imperial, so to speak, and share the work that we've been doing. And a lot of it had its root in my start at Imperial, um, my first faculty position. So today I'll share with you some of the work we're doing on basically data assimilation and filling in the gap, gaps in turbulent data. And um, this work is really the fruit of uh, the effort of a number of students and postdocs. And the top row has uh, the Meng Zawang, who's done a lot of this work that we'll present today, and Chi, who's a former student who's now a postdoc in the group, and David Bokta, who's applying these ideas to high speed flows. And on the second row are people who are also working in the same area, but in different flow regimes and using different techniques. Um, so my interest in interpretation of sensor measurement comes from originally from high speed flows, while today I will be talking about turbulence and low Mach number. I originally started working on this problem in high speed transition. And this here is a picture of the Space Shuttle Columbia. And this infrared image shows you um, local heating on the shuttle. So you might get a picture like this and you're ultimately interested in interpreting what are the implications for uh, the flow. You want to know the flow environment when you all you have are these surface data. And in fact, these infrared images you can see there's no sign. You just see the local heating, so you know there was turbulence, but there's no sign of the instability waves that generated this turbulence. And I spend a lot of my time lo looking at evolution of instability wave and transition to turbulence, which is the forward problem. But here you have an observation of the heating on the surface and you want to solve the inverse problem and figure out what generated it. And clearly there are numerous ways this transition to turbulence could have happened. And in fact, just looking here and seeing that you don't uh, observe the instability wave, you just see the turbulence spot, tells you that this imaging technique is averaging over many instability waves, um, um, tens or hundreds of instability waves. And also the frequency of the measurement tends to be very uh, limited. Um, of course, uh, we know the history of Columbia. Uh, we lost that shuttle in 2003 and excessive heating was and transition, premature transition to turbulence were blamed for this incident. Um, you can sacrifice, um, if you want to go after higher temporal resolution, for example, you might want to have PCB sensors that would give you pressure data. And now you can start to see a pattern of what you would consider, you would think is instability waves. Nonetheless, even these sensors that are uh, specifically designed for high-speed applications, they need to be able to measure upwards of 100 or 200 kilohertz. Most of these sensors can maybe resolve the um, primary instability waves, but I have a hard time with higher harmonics. And also because of the finite sensor size, you have some sort of averaging procedure uh, or filtering over the sensor. And what we're interested in is how do you take the sensor data and recognize that we're not just basically measuring the local pressure at this location at this point in time, but rather we have an encoding of the previous flow events. And if you can decode the sensor data, you can discover the antecedent flow events that led to these measurements. So in fact, we've done exactly that for PCB sensors and high-speed uh, boundary layers, and we were able to predict the entire flow field that generated these measurements. And this paper has been accepted uh, to be published in JFM recently. And basically the philosophy is, well, you solve an optimization problem when you try to identify the flow condition that optimally reproduce the sensor data. Now, there are significant challenges in trying to solve this problem. And the first one is oftentimes the sensor data are limited. Um, so you don't have a measurement of the uh, enough observations, but also the field equations are nonlinear. So you're trying to go from observation and predict the state, and you have to invert this large nonlinear uh, 
set of field equations. And the system we're interested in, just like the transition example, are chaotic. So if you have any small perturbations in your measurements, they amplify um, according to Leibniz exponent to the system, and that really frustrates your ability to interpret the measurements. Um, so um, add to that that the inverse problem is often not unique. My favorite example of non-unique problem is one we worked on for some time, and it's interpretation of scalar um, measurements. So if you think of a plume, this here is a scalar plume in turbulent channel flow, and it's released from this point, and you have sensor data here. You collect data at this sensor, and you can see that the sensor gets an intermittent signal. Um, so you're not getting a signal all the time, and that signal is intermittent, and it's encoded by the turbulence that dispersed the scalar. The non-uniqueness, you can really show it very nicely by simply holding the sensor location fix. So in these three experiments here, we kept the sensor at this downstream location, and I displaced the source further up, uh, upstream. And I want you to look at the um, plumes that are generated. And here, I will plot as a function of time the record of the sensor signal. And what I want you to notice is how these records are almost indistinguishable. So you can see these are the records at the three sensors due to three different sources. And it's very hard to tell the difference between the three sensor signals. And the reason it's difficult is because when we displace the source, we increase this intensity. Um, so you can tell that these sen sec sensor signals are very highly correlated, even though the sources have been displaced integral length scales. So ultimately, inverting this going from sensor signal to a source location is a very difficult problem. And we know in the linear limit, it has infinite number of solutions. So this starts to introduce the idea, what is the optimal sensor placement? We often think the optimal sensor placement is one that gives you the best signal to the noise ratio or the one that would give you uh, useful, it gives you information all the time. So you might wanna put it directly behind the source. Well, it turns out if you think about the inverse problem, you're not just trying to measure the scalar at a point, you're trying to invert that signal to predict what led to it. So you don't want to place the sensor necessarily where you have the strongest signal. You want to place the sensor at a location where it has the highest sensitivity to the source. So it turns out actually, uh, if you optimize the sensor placement, which we've done in this case, the best placement of the sensor is at the edge of the average wake from many different potential sources. Why is it at the edge? Because the intermittency at the edge tells you how far the source is. But being immediately behind the source, you're really just getting a continuous signal and its intensity depends on the strength of the source and it's very difficult to interpret. But if you're at the edge of, the, of that um, plume, you actually can use that intermittency to solve the inverse problem accurately. So, it starts becoming enriching thinking about these sensors and how to decode them. How do you place them in the flow? And how do you weigh them? If I have a measurement of the scalar and scalar gradients or scalar and uh, velocity, how do you weigh these sensors to be able to get the most accurate uh, interpretation of the field? So we have a group of students working um, on these problem in the context of scalar dispersion, in the context of high-speed flows. And today I will be discussing with you the uh, turbulence data. So the problem we're interested in for the rest of the talk is wall turbulence. And the very basic question that we have is what is the minimum spatial temporal resolution for which you have to measure turbulence to be able to reconstruct all the missing information? And we don't want to estimate just the state uh, with small error. We want the estimated state to enable us to do forecasts. Um, so when we go from these limited measurements to the full state, our key consideration is, are we sufficiently accurate to be able to forecast the evolution of turbulence beyond the measurement time horizon? Um, and some practical considerations. Um, in experiments, it's very difficult to measure all the way down to the wall. So we ask the question, if I have measurements away from the wall, can I fill in the gap all the way down to the wall? given that, for example, the buffer layer, which I may not be able to measure, has a very significant production of kinetic energy. Um, the most challenging problem is if you have wall measurements, which you expect that that's what you would have in realistic flows, 
or applications, can you predict the flow based on the wall signature? And once, after we do all of these problems, we're gonna really focus on just taking an isolated measurement in space and time and ask ourselves, what is the domain of dependence of this measurement? And that will um, really open up uh, many opportunities to be able to fully understand what does it mean to measure shear stress or measure pressure at the wall and what information is encoded in it and how well can we uh, use the information to predict turbulence. Our approach will be 4D VAR, uh, so a joint variational data simulation, which is well established in numerical weather prediction. And we'll first look at what can be done and then try to explain our ability to reproduce the turbulence. So um, to generate measurements, uh, we're not working with physical measurements. We're going to do a surrogate um, experiment. So basically I will perform an independent numerical simulation, uh, a very, uh, very resolved DNS. And I will call this here UR, which will be our true flow or the real flow, which will be unknown to us We'll extract observations and then we'll forget that we know the solution. Ultimately, we'll compare to it to see how well we've done. But for now, we just basically perform this experiment and collect observations. So it's channel flow. Uh, we've done experiments at many different Reynolds number, but most of the results that I'll present today will be either 180 or 590 RE tau. And we perform the calculation, the DNS, and we introduce these sensors at these uh, probes and we record a history of the flow in space and time at these probe locations, we can see clearly under resolve the turbulence. Our measurements I will call M and uh, those are the true measurements. And they're basically a measurement operator, uh, MathCal M acting on the true flow field. Uh, so my measurements are distributed in space and in time. Using these measurements, I want to be able uh, to predict what was the initial condition that generated all these measurements. So what we do here is we uh, say, okay, well, I can start with an estimate of the initial condition. So I'll call that U naught, and I can solve Navier-Stokes equation. So this is N of U naught, and that gives me a, a, a prediction of the flow state. So UN is my estimated flow field. I can use DNS, I could use uh, LES, DES, your favorite tool. Then from my estimate of the flow field, I can collect what I would call my model observation using the same model operate, uh, measurement operator. So if this, for example, was slurring, I could do line of sight integration and look at density gradient. If this is a PCB sensor, I could do filtering of the pressure signal at the wall. In this case, we're looking at velocity observation. So I sample the, my calculation to get velocity observations and I can compare them to the true measurements. And I define a cost function, which is the difference between my model observation and the true measurement. And I want to minimize this cost function. So I want to predict the initial condition of my channel flow calculation that minimizes this cost function. To be able to minimize the cost function, I need this gradient with respect to this initial condition. And in our group, we've developed on some, uh, four DVAR methods, onVAR techniques, and uh, also machine learning techniques to be able to do this, uh, compute the gradient of this cost function. Okay, so today we'll talk about 4D VAR, so basically a joint techniques. The procedure is computationally expensive um, and requires a lot of storage, but it's the best way to be able to, uh, basically the gold standard for predicting a uh, large, um, control vector u naught because it depends on three-dimensional space. So it's nx by ny by nz uh, control vector. So you start with the estimate of my initial condition and that's what I want to optimize. And I solve Navier-Stokes. And as I solve Navier-Stokes equation forward in time, I have to store the forward flow field uh, un. And I also compare my predictions to these measurements that I had along the way. Um, and the difference between my predictions and the measurements is my error. And once I reach the time horizon over which I have data, then I have to solve the adjoint equation backwards in time. And star here is my adjoint Navier-Stokes. And the forcing term for the adjoint Navier-Stokes is the disparity between my predictions 
of the measurements and the true measurements. And at the end of the adjoint loop, I have the gradient of the cost function, which I use to update my estimate of the initial condition. We perform this procedure uh, many times till the cost function drops um, an order of magnitude or, uh, or so. And then we look at the estimated field and compare it to the true flow field. So, and ask ourselves how well were we able to reconstruct the initial condition from limited observations. Um, the problem setup is an RE tau 180. The surrogate experiment was performed with DNS resolutions. So delta X, Z, and Y plus are listed here um, and delta T plus as well. Our first experiment to see how well we can perform um, use data that is one eighth the resolution in X, Y, Z, and in time. Uh, so basically our observations from the experiments are every 50 units, 30 units, here eight, and then uh, 0.5 delta T plus. So ultimately, if you think about it, this is one over 4,000 or 5,000, the resolution of DNS. And then our initial guess will be simply interpolating the observations, and then we try to refine that. Um, our observation time horizon is 50 plus units. And of course, we're interested in being able to make forecasts beyond the 50 time units. So here I'm comparing the true initial condition, UR, which is unknown to us, um, and my reconstruction of the initial condition. And you can see that we do reasonably well. Um, you can see here the low and high uh, velocity perturbations, and you can see them reproduced in this image. But I want you to pay attention to this noise in my reconstruction and how, as I do the forward evolution, this noise disappears and we latch onto that true flow. So now we're predicting the true flow accurately. The other point that I want to uh, um, emphasize here is that this time here is 12 time units. The observations were only given to us over four time units, and now we're making prediction beyond the observation time horizon. And we are actually predicting the trajectories beyond the duration of the observations. We can quantify the errors. And here I'm plotting the error versus the channel height. So one wall is at zero, the other wall is at two. And this is the adder in the U component and the adder in the V component. And you can see at the initial time, my adders are about 6% in U and 2.5% 2 and in V. And this is the adder in the initial condition. But if I advance my initial condition that I predicted, if I compute its evolution, you could see by the, by the end of the time horizon, the adder in this condition has dropped uh, significantly. It's less than 1%. In fact, we can plot, I can integrate this adder in Y and I can plot it versus time. So you can see here's the adder decaying in time um, over the time horizon of the observation. Now, what happens if I no longer have observations at 4.2? Uh, I showed you that we can make forecast beyond 4.2 or the duration of the observation. So now the shaded region is shrunk. This is the observation time is the shaded region. And my adder that was nicely decaying starts to amplify because I no longer have observations. I point you to the fact that if I had just marched my, my initial the observations by interpolation and then marshing, you know, if you start with the observation and try to march them, your adder diverges immediately. So what I, my 4D var allowed me was to shrink the adders to less than 1% uh, before they start to diverge. Um, now, if you get another injection of data, you can start from this point here and do the on var, uh, the 4D var again and drop the adder down. But once you no longer have observation, you start to diverge. Just a comment about why the adder decay, um, the adders decay during the observation time horizon. When you do a joint um, 4D var or um, the adjoint loop basically takes the adders and marsh them, marshes them back in time. So the adders that you have at the final time are marshed backwards with the adjoint and they amplify in backward time according to Lyapunov exponent. So 
when you update your cost function, when you update the initial condition, it's most influenced by the errors that you have at the final time. So you're accruing error, you compute the error as you march. The error at capital T, when you march back, have the longest time to amplify. Uh, and these are the ones that dominate your update of the initial condition. And that's why you get the best prediction of the final time. Okay. How well do we do, not just in terms of velocity, um, how do, well do we do in terms of vorticity and vortical structures? So if you look at the vortical structure, these are lambda two of the true flow. And if you just take your observations and you compute your vortical structure, this is what you would get just from the observations that are really coarse grains. Um, if you use our 4D var to be able to predict the initial condition, you get a much um, richer, a bit noisy, uh, representation of the flow st structure at the initial time. But once again, as you marsh, this initial noise disappears and you're reproducing the flow structures that are in the flow accurately. Uh, we can quantify the accuracy by looking at the adder in vorticity. Um, and we can, if we do that, I can plot the adder in vorticity, spanwise vorticity here, as a function of one normal height. This dashed line is the error in vorticity if you just use your observations and some sort of interpolation between them. You're looking at error in vorticity on the order of, um, if you're generous, you say 10%, but it goes all the way up to 40%. Our results are the bottom curve here, the gray one, they're less than um, 3%. And then if I artificially add noise to the measurements to see how robust my algorithm is, we added 5% noise to the, to the observations or the experimental measurements. And we added 10% noise. And you can see we are robust to this noise in the measurements and we can reconstruct the vertical structures with errors that are much less than the 10% error that we introduced in our observations. So our algorithm is working. It gives us information that is missing in the original observation that satisfy Navier-Stokes um, and reproduce the measurement. Now we want to know the dependence of our accuracy on the distance between measurements and the dependence on our accuracy uh, if we have a criteria uh, in terms of uh, some length scales that we um, that have physical significance in turbines. So those are two spanwise planes in the channel. So one at Z measurement location, ZM. So I took a plane where I have measurements, Z equals ZM. And you can see obviously, our reconstruction of the flow and the true flow match. Color are um, our reconstruction and the lines are the true flow. And the fact that they will coincide says, well, we're reproducing the measurements. But if I move away from the measurement plane in the span, you could see now the lines and the colors are not aligned. That means my prediction of the flow away from measurement stations is not as good um, because the line and the colors don't match means my prediction and the true flow are different. I can compute the adders as a function of span y spacing. And we have done this exercise. So we systematically change the distance between span wise measurement stations and see how the adder depends on distance from the measurement station. So here, delta z plus between measurement station is 100 units. And we have very low adders at the two measurement stations. And in between them, the adder increases as I move away from the measurement station. And you can see here, our reconstruction is very poor quality. We have 140% uh, adder. So of course, if I, the measurement stations are closer together, uh, 50 plus units, then you could see the adder now drops to 50%. If I bring them closer and closer, the adder improves. So what is the length scale that has to separate measurement station and experimental measurements to be able to actually reconstruct the flow in between accurately. And when I mean accurately, I mean at or less than 1% and we can predict trajectories. So we can look at the flow structures using the spanwise two-point correlation. So this here is RU, the streamwise velocity correlation as a function of spanwise distance at different heights in the channel. And you can see that the correlation drops. Um, and depending on if you're near the wall, you have narrow structures. If you move away from the wall, you have larger structures. And we compare that to 
the correlation between our prediction of the flow and the true flow. Um, so if I start at the measurement location, my prediction of the flow and the true flow are perfectly correlated. And if I move away from the measurement station, so this delta Z now is moving away from a measurement point, I get less and less correlated. Um, we might be tempted to think that we're only reproducing flows where we have a correlation, but that's not true. If you look at Y plus 17, the flow decorrelates by 28 plus units. Um, and if you look at distance 28 plus units from the measurement station, our correlation is over 50%. So we're not only, uh, of course, we benefit from the flow being correlated, but there's more to the story. Now we can define a length scale from this correlation. We can define a Taylor microscale. And now we can compare a Taylor microscale of the turbulence, how it depends on wall normal distance, that's the dashed line, and you can compute a Terrell mark microscale from our correlation uh, between the truth and our data, and you have this line. So you can think of it as the domain of dependence of my measurement. Every measurement I have in the span has a spanwise domain of dependence, which is on the order of the Taylor microscale. The spanwise direction is nice because it doesn't have any advection, mean advection. Now, if you look at the streamwise direction, we have streamwise spacing of the measurements, but we also have time. And they're related, of course, by uh, Taylor's hypothesis. So here we look at the effect of the distance between streamwise measurement planes. So uh, we have measurement at zero at delta xm is the first location of the measurement, twice delta xm and three times delta xm. And what I'm plotting here are the initial errors. Of course, our initial condition is uh, almost perfect at the measurement locations, and it's not um, as accurate away from the measurement location. So the errors are higher between measurement stations. But I point your attention to this region here. I have low errors in this region in my initial condition. Why? Because when I march this initial condition, this parcel of fluid here is going to land on a measurement station at a measurement time. So you could see our initial condition has an accurate region because it has to satisfy a measurement at a measurement station at a measurement time. So if you watch this video, I want you to notice this blob becoming more accurate as it approaches the measurement station. And as time evolves, we have lower and lower errors throughout our evolution. So if you take one height, we can plot an XT diagram. So this is X uh, and the measurement station are marked here. And this is time. And you can see two types of low error regions. Once the start exactly at uh, from the measurement point and ones that start uh, in the middle of the flow and converge onto a measurement point. So A starts at the measurement points accurate reason that propagates downstream, while B starts within the flow and gains accurately as it lands onto a measurement station later in time. We can construct a diagram that tells us what are the requirements for measurements to be able to have an accurate reconstruction. So space and time are related in the streamwise direction. We can say the streamwise separation between measurement station has to be less than the Taylor micro scale again, but the measurement frequency uh, has to be, uh, is bounded by a Lyapunov time scale. If you only have measurements that are separated by very large periods of time, you have chaos working against you in your ability to be able to predict the flow accurately. Um, so this here is the region of X, delta X measurement and delta T of the measurement that we can accurately reconstruct. I can treat space and time. So I can divide by the advection velocity and this condition here for the separation in space because it becomes a separation in time. And here I multiply by the advection velocity and the condition for time becomes a condition for space. So I can trade time for spatial um, separation. Um, and every one of these circles is a data simulation experiment that we've performed and where we're able to accurately reconstruct the flow. Accuracy means 
correlation coefficient between our prediction and the truth that are over 95%. If we start separating the measurements in space and time further apart in this criteria, we start to uh, not be able to achieve such high accuracy in our prediction. We cannot reproduce the trajectories um, accurately in the forward evolution. Now, we can make this problem more challenging by saying, let's remove a wall layer. Let's say we have these under-resolved measurements in the bulk of the flow, but in an experiment, I might not be able to measure anything below y plus equal to, let's say, 30. So now we're missing out a, an important dynamical region where you have significant turbine kinetic energy production. Um, so we do the same exercise and try to predict the initial condition at full resolution that explains the data. And this here is a plane at y plus equals 17. And we're looking at the truth versus our reconstruction. So you can see we, we're getting close to the truth. But the reality is if you look, if you quantify the errors, you can see our errors inside this region, this vertical line is y plus equal to 30. You can see we have significant errors uh, in the buffer layer. Uh, they're still less than 5%. So we're reconstructing the flow near the wall with some accuracy. Um, um, but it's worse than what we did when we had uh, some observation in this layer. The most challenging case, of course, is if you have just wall measurements. So here we're looking at, can we start from wall observations and no other information whatsoever and build the entire turbulent channel flow? And um, all the vorticity in turbulent channel flow comes from the wall. So um, the question is, um, can we actually go from wall observation and reconstruct the turbine? So we have this wall measurements of stress. Um, we actually have streamwise, spanwise, uh, shear stress and pressure. Um, and we construct an initial estimate using a linear stochastic estimator. So uh, this is here the truth. And if you use a linear stochastic estimator to use the wall shear stress and reconstruct the flow, this is what you get. So this here replaces our interpolation of observation that we used earlier. Uh, now we use a linear stochastic estimator. And then we do 4D var on this linear stochastic estimation, and we can predict uh, with some better accuracy the flow. Certainly we predict the flow near the wall, and we get a sense of what the outer large scale motions that have a, an impression on the wall shear stress look like. We can try to quantify this. Um, so here I'm plotting two planes at y plus equal to 15. So close to the wall where we're making the measurements. And you can see the true state and our prediction uh, qualitatively similar. And here I'm plotting the correlation coefficient between those two planes. So the first point is at y plus 17. So you have a correlation of over 95%. If you move further up, you can see our reconstruction is not as accurate. And you can see the correlation dropping. Uh, this is a Reynolds number 590. And if you go up even further towards the channel center or in the log layer, the correlation drops. You can see we've done this exercise at Reynolds, Arita, 100, 180, 390, and 590. And you can see invariably that correlation, once you hit the buffer layer, so y plus is about 30, these correlations start to drop. And uh, you have some ability to reconstruct the outer large scale motions. You can see here, basically, we're predicting these large scale structures uh, with some success. You can look at these red regions here. They match the red regions you have in the truth. And that's what gives us some correlation in the outer flow. If you're interested in high shear stress events near the wall, um, these are um, basically outliers in the distribution of the shear stress. Uh, we studied them in a paper with Greg Eink um, using uh, stochastic Cauchy invariance to figure out the origin of these high shear stress events. We predict them accurately. So we've identified two such events here and we're plotting the vortex lines for a sweep event and injection event. And our method can reconstruct these important events accurately. Now the question is, um, what's the best you can hope for? What are the limitation of a particular measurement? Ultimately, you have to go back and recognize that you're solving this inverse problem. 
we have a cost function, which is the difference between my prediction of the measurements and the true measurements. The shape of the cost function might look like this. Uh, so it's a very treacherous domain and you start at some point with an initial gas and you have to march to find the global minima. Um, and of course, you, ha you have all these local minima along the way. How do you navigate this cost function? And what does it look like? How can you find the shape of the cost function? This particular cost function comes from a, um, a simple Lorentz system. But for our turbulent channel flow, we don't know what the cost function looks like. And in fact, the shape of the cost function depends on the measurements themselves. What are you measuring and um, how often you're measuring that quantity and where you're measuring it? So some of the, the members of the group are working on how do you go from such cost function to a much smoother one? And there are ways to do it, for example, by weighing different measurements to uh, minimize the uncertainty in your ability to solve the inverse problem, weighing the measurement, placing them favorably. So there are ways to go about doing this, but ultimately we're interested in knowing the shape of the cost function for measurements of shear stress for our current problem. So this brings me to the second half of the talk about what is the landscape of the cost function. And if I measure shear stress at the wall, what am I actually able to deduce within the flow? So we're going to idealize the problem slightly. We're going to focus on obser wall observation of the shear stress. So my cost function now is the difference between the shear stress that I predict from my model and the experimental shear stress or the true shear stress observations that I was given from the experiment. And to simplify the problem, we're going to assume that we have a very good estimate of the flow field. Um, so my prediction is almost perfect. My prediction, my estimate of the initial condition is almost the true. In fact, it is at the truth. So the gradient of the cost function vanishes and all I have left is the curvature or the Hessian of the cost function. The Hessian of the cost function will tell me how well I can move towards this optimal and how much confidence do I have in it. Um, so we're not gonna map the entire cost function, but we're going to get to see what what is the curvature of the cost function looks like? And if you have directions that we have high sensitivity to, you're going to have strong curvature. And if your Hessian has very weak curvature, that means basically you have no sensitivity. Any solution looks like it is uh, can reproduce the data. You have no sensitivity to the data. Um, so since we are very close or at the optimal uh, initial condition, I can uh, introduce this U prime, which is uh, a perturbation to the truth. So the difference between my predicted flow field and the true flow field will be U prime. And I can rewrite my cost function in terms of U prime. But because we are at the optimal, I can linearize the equation around the optimal, the true flow UR. So this here is the evolution equation for U prime, a perturbation from the true initial condition. And uh, just a comment, I haven't thrown away chaos because the small linear perturbation to the true flow is evolved by the true flow. So if you add the perturbation to the to true flow and compute its forward evolution, um, you could see that U prime will grow exponentially at the Lyapunov exponent. And if you look how the energy is growing, you can see it's growing exponentially in time. So that U prime still experiences forward chaos. So now we ask ourselves, um, how about measurements? So now I have the true initial condition and I want to know how sensitive is my measurement to changes in the true initial condition. So that's the sensitivity of my measurement. So what I can do is I say, okay, well, the change in my measurement is du prime dy, okay? At the measurement location x, m, and ZM. Well, I can write this as a measurement kernel, which is DDY um, times uh, the forward velocity field. And the forward velocity field is nothing but taking the perturbation to the initial condition and marshing it with Navier-Stokes. So to compute this sensitivity of my measurement here at XM, ZM, 
Um, basically, what I have to do, I have to take my initial condition and I perturb it, solve Navier-Stokes, and collect measurements. And I have to go to every point in the initial condition, x, y, z, u, v, w, and p, and introduce a small perturbation and march it with the Navier-Stokes and compute, take the measurements and be able to look at the sensitivity. Or I can use the adjoint to move the A operator to act on the measurement kernel. So now we moved A to A star. So now this equation, it says, well, actually, instead of solving all these many different forward problem, just start from a measurement kernel and solve the adjoint equation. And this gives you an adjoint field U star. So you only do one adjoint calculation and you take this U star and you can multiply it by any perturbation to your initial condition. And that gives you the sensitivity, basically what changes you observe at your sensor. So now we only have to do an adjoint calculation from the measurement kernel back in time. So if I release a pulse at the measurement location, so measuring shear stress at a point, uh, what do we get in backward time? This here is the domain of dependence of this measurement back in time. And you get this adjoint spot that is propagating back in time. Here, I assume I'm measuring streamwise shear stress. Uh, and you look back in time, T plus is 2, 4, 8, 16. You have this adjoint spot that is spreading back in time. And we're looking at the adjoint spot for Arita 180 and 590. And you can see that in plus unit, there is this universality back in time for the domain of dependence of the measurement. We can compare measurement of streamwise shear stress, spanwise shear stress, and pressure. Unsurprisingly, the domain of dependence and the pressure is the largest. Um, but for the rest of the talk, we'll focus on the streamwise shear stress. So how does this um, help us figure out the shape of the cost function? So I can rewrite my cost function uh, Instead of du prime dy, I can write it in terms of this equation that we just derived, the adjoint field that comes from the measurement kernel times any perturbation to the initial condition. The beauty of this expression is now you can take derivative of the cost function with respect to the initial condition, and you can find the second derivative or the Hessian of the cost function very efficiently. If you look at the Hessian of the cost function, it's only the cross correlation of the adjoint field. So we only need to solve the adjoint equation and we can construct the hash. Instead of integrating over the area, we can do a, because it's homogeneous, we can do an ensemble average uh, from different pulses at different locations. So we can compute the ensemble average Hessian um, and we can also analyze it in terms of its Fourier component. So for every Kx and Kz, um, I can look at the, this Hessian matrix and I can look at its eigenspectrum. It's a very expensive computation, but we've performed it. And here we're looking at the eigenspectrum of this Hessian matrix uh, at uh, two plus units back in time from the measurement. So basically I made a measurement and I want to know what does it allow me to interpret two plus units earlier in time. And the eigenspectrum of the Hessian as a function of Kx plus and Kz plus is plotted here. At every Kx, Kz, you have many eigenvalues. We are looking at the top two, uh, this top pair. And basically this here is the highest eigenvalue. It gives you the highest sensitivity. This measurement, is most sensitive to two-dimensional wave that have Kx plus is 0.15 and Kz equal to zero. And you can see here the shape of this two-dimensional perturbation that a shear stress is sensitive to. And if you look at the spanwise vorticity, it's plotted here. So this here is the largest eigenvalue of the Hessian. If you have a measurement of Walsh shear stress, it can interpret it's most sensitive to perturbation of this form two time units earlier. Uh, 
So if you have this perturbation two times units, two time units later, uh, the measurement of the stress would be most affected. Okay, now what happens at longer time? If I want to interpret something that happened even earlier in time, so instead of T plus two, I can go to T plus 20. And you could see now you're more sensitive to uh, streamwise aligned structures. So Kx plus and Kz plus are zero and 0 0.02. So these are rows uh, at T plus equal to 20 before the measurement that will generate a wall shear stress uh, later in time at the measurement time. So these are the directions that you can most effectively reconstruct. Now, how can we relate this information to our attempt to reconstruct the turbulence from wall measurements only? If you recall, we could only reconstruct the near wall region. We couldn't reconstruct beyond the buffer layer as accurately. So what we could do is we can look at these eigenfunctions and we can define for example, the center of mass of this eigenfunction, clearly while shear stress is sensitive to uh, this height, less sensitive to what happens away from the wall. And we define another height, which we call 10% of maximum sensitivity. And you can see these two modes here. Uh, we can compute what this Y center of mass and Y 10% look like as a function of backward time. And you can see, the measurement is only sensitive to the near wall region um, for short time horizons. But if you allow yourself longer time horizons, you become more sensitive to what happens away from the wall. Because this edge joint spot is spreading as you go back in time longer and longer. But you could see also that your sensitivity kind of levels off. Uh, so now T plus is 200 and your sensitivity is not protruding very far into the outer flow. This quantity is average over the entire spectrum, but if you look, some modes have finite sensitivity above the buffer layer. So look, Y plus is equal to 30. Some modes are completely gone above 30, but some modes continue to have sensitivity. So some structures in the outer region do have a wall impression. More importantly, the shear stress can be uh, used to interpret these structures. And if we go back to our two-point correlation, these are three planes here, uh, basically moving away from the wall. And you could see the correlation decays uh, because the sensitivity of the measurement in backward time decays away from the wall. Naturally, you might say, why don't we just keep going backward in time indefinitely? And uh, this curve will reach the entire channel. Well, you have something working against you and that's chaos. Um, if you continue to march back in time, what started as a very nice uh, deterministic or, or organized spot in backward time ultimately becomes chaos. So I think this is the chaos backwards. We always think if I have small perturbations in initial condition, states diversion forward time. But here, if you have small errors in your measurements, um, your adjoint will also diverge in backward time. Uh, you can think of this in terms of having uh, potentially two entirely different initial conditions that can generate the same measurement. And we've seen that in idealized system and Lorentz system, for example, you can have two different initial conditions that produce exact, almost identical um, measurements. So that works against you. You cannot go back indefinitely in time. In fact, if you solve the forward and the adjoint equations, uh, over time, uh, for long periods, you can see the forward equation gives you forward chaos and the adjoint equation gives you adjoint chaos. And if you look at where that chaos is concentrating, what is that kinetic turbulent kinetic energy, if you will, um, for the forward case, um, it's this blue curve here. You can see this is uh, reminiscent of what we know of forward turbulence. Um, and then if you look at the adjoint chaos, it's much more concentrated in the um, buffer layer. So um, now you can, um, I mentioned this before, now this opens up opportunities to discuss this uh, or to study this backward chaos or the adjoint chaos 
and how it affects our measurements. And we're doing that now. We're looking at just like you can do the budget for the generation of uh, perturbations in the forward field. This is the turbine kinetic energy budget of the forward perturbations. You can write one for the adjoint. And even though uh, it looks very similar to the forward field, the fact that you reverse advection, now you could see your uh, turbulence budget has changed significantly. And now we're actually analyzing this, uh, these data and trying to learn more about the generation of chaos in adjoint fields. Um, so this brings me to the conclusion of this part of the talk. Uh, the basic questions that I discussed today are all in a paper that was just recently accepted uh, a week or so ago in JFM. Um, it's also on the archive. Um, the Taylor microscale is a very important um, lens scale in terms of our ability to be able to fill in the gap between measurements. Um, and um, we can go from measurements in the outer flow and be able to reconstruct missing layers. Um, and also uh, we can start from the wall and try to reconstruct the flow above the wall all the way to the buffer layer as well as the outer large scale structures that have a signature. And the key to understanding all the limitations in terms of solving the inverse problem is really to study the adjoint field and the sensitivity of observation kernels to earlier conditions in the flow. Um, I think if you, um, yeah, and the hashing gives you the most sensitive direction that we can reconstruct accurately. Um, so I can stop here or I can show you one more uh, result that we just had recently that I think might be of interest. So maybe I'll stop and take questions, but if, if there are no questions, we can go a little further. All right. Thanks, Tamer, for that very, very nice talk. Uh, I think we can start with the questions. Uh, I open the floor and uh, please unmute yourself and, and uh, ask a question. And while you may think about one, let me, let me start out. Um, in your in the first part, is there any gain uh, in terms of prediction horizon by including uh, delay coordinates to to take signals and the signal back in time as your measurement, or is this already coded in into your array of sensors? It's already coded in the array of sensors. So basically, your your array of sensors already has, um, if you take a sensor row and you, sh you have a relationship because you have another X location earlier upstream. So that delay is already baked in essentially. So you wouldn't gain anything in, in, uh, in keeping a measurement and a measurement at Delta T back and a measurement at Delta T back and so on. The, the, when, when we actually do the assimilation, we have the measurements as a function of space and in time. So the entire time, the, all the time series of measurements is included in the assimilation. We, I, so, so your measurement vector is the measurement at all spatial locations at different snapshots in time, right? So it's separated by delta TM. So that's already included. I see, I see, okay, okay. So that, yeah, so it's not, you know, it's not time step to time step like you would do with a filter. This is a smoother where you take the initial condition that reproduces the entire uh, space time series of measurements. You have all of it. I see. Okay. Okay. Also on this, on the second part, do you have any estimate about the Reynolds number dependence of that uh, adjoint chaos? You know, how, how far, how, how badly does it scale as you go to higher and higher speeds? So the, Lyapunov exponent in plus unit doesn't change so much. We've, take, we've computed it for 100, 183, 90, 590, and 1,000. And the exponent in plus units, uh, the Lyapunov time scale in plus units is, drops from 50 to maybe 45. So it changes a bit. It scales with Reynolds number. Um, the forward and the adjoint have the same Lyapunov exponent. Yeah. So we're trying to get a scaling for the forward one because it's cheaper. Because for the adjoint one, it's it's a bit more expensive to compute. So uh, it scales with Reynolds number, but not, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a strong scaling with Reynolds number. I see. Okay. But of course that's in plus units. So, so in reality, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty bad here. Yeah. yeah, good, good. All right, any questions from the audience? Uh,
No? No questions from the audience? All right. All right, maybe I'll show you one more thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I was about to say. All right, so go ahead. Continuous data assimilation. Ho hopefully, this will get people curious. Um, so, continuous data assimilation. So, imagine the following. So far, we've tried to predict the initial condition, and that's somewhat difficult. But now, imagine if you have data and you want to be able to latch onto the trajectory just without having to predict the initial condition. You say, I don't care about the past, I just want to predict the future. And the idea of continuous data assimilation um, dates back to the 60s, where people wanted to take large, large scale weather a pattern and impose it onto smaller calculation and try to enslave the smaller calculations. Um, and it was uh, called Yoshida called the regeneration of small eddies and Lulescu Manival and I called it synchronization of chaos. So imagine two calculation. This here is the truth that evolves forward in time. And then there's another simulation where we only know the flow outside this layer. So, so there's an unknown layer um, but we have everything outside that layer. And what we do is we simulate this flow. And here we just start with white noise. And every time step, we copy the region that we know to overwrite our solution. So of course, if I advance this in time, it's going to deviate from the truth because I have all this noise on it. But every time step, I overwrite the part that I know. I just like, you know, I don't want it to deviate. I overwrite it and overwrite it. And I ask, do these two calculations synchronize? And when they synchronize, I mean they have to be accurate to machine precision. Um, so that's the idea of synchronization. So um, just to kind of show you, this here is the truth. And here I removed the wall layer entirely and replaced it with white noise. And you could see it synchronizes very quickly, actually. Um, so the two calculations latch onto the same trajectory, or the second calculation latches onto the same trajectory. Now, how big is that layer that you can remove? So we start to remove a layer, which is eight plus units. And here I'm plotting the error between the two calculations, the original and the synchronization. Um, and you can see the error drops just exponentially fast. Now, what if I were to blank 16 units? Okay, it takes longer to synchronize. And look, the error drops to 10 to negative 10. If I remove 28 units above the wall, and I, I can synchronize, but it's even slower. So I can plot. So this is the synchronization exponent. And it's negative because the error decays. And at some point, you hit 0. You can no longer synchronize. So if you remove about 32 plus units, you can no longer synchronize. And this here is universal. It's the same layer near the wall for any Reynolds number. Of course, physically, it's a thinner and thinner layer. But you can remove 32 units from channel flow entirely. And you can, sync, you can basically rebuild it um, without any uh, to machine precision. Um, and you can repeat this exercise. It's not just the wall layer. You know, this here is. Uh, we've done it at three different layers away from the wall. You could do it as many as you want. And you could see you start from white noise in this layer. And ultimately, the line and the colors align, which means it synchronizes. And there is a height at every Y location. There's a certain layer that you can remove. And you can rebuild it to machine precision. And you can plot it here. So this here is the height away from the wall. And this is the thickness of the layer that you can throw out and rebuild to machine precision. And you can see it grows as you move away from the wall. And again, unsurprisingly, it's related to the Taylor microscale. So this really brings a nice interpretation. If you think about the Taylor microscale, it's the distance traveled by a Kolmogorov eddy during its lifetime. If you take a Kolmogorov eddy, and during its lifetime, it's being swept by the RMS velocity or bigger eddies. And how much does it cover? And it covers the Taylor microscale. So if you remove a layer, which is you know, basically the Taylor microscale from this point and this point, by this process of um, transporting Kolmogorov eddies around the Taylor microscale, you can repaint that missing layer to machine precision. Um, so I thought that was a really neat um, synchronization of chaos, where we're not just 
removing, notice we're removing the entire layer. So they're very large scale X and Z structures that are being removed and you can rebuild them. Um, so that was the latest result that we just had recently. And I thought people might be interested in that. Very interesting. Good. Good. All right. Any more questions from the audience? Hello, can I can I ask something? This is Shahid Mughal from Imperial. Yeah. Um, if you, if you if you if you marched back in time and in space, uh, you know, and, and you march far enough upstream, starting with a turbulent field, are you able to also predict the lab, the the sort of return to laminarity as well and the initial state that started this process off? Uh, so we uh, we haven't looked at transitional. Uh, periodic transitional flow. So we haven't done transition, for example, in a uh, channel flow or Taylor or circular quet. We've done transition in um, boundary layers where uh, instead of going back in time, you're going back in space. And you can start from measurements that have turbulence and go back in space and predict a, an inflow condition that generated that turbulence. So in, in context of boundary layers, yeah, you can go from the turbulent region back to the laminar region. And something very interesting happens. So we're, we're actually working on this. Something, if you start from the laminar region and look at the region of sensitivity and how it grows back in time versus you start within the turbulence, the rate of spreading of the adjoint region changes dramatically when you go from the turbulent region to the laminar region. Um, so we're working, actually, this is a very interesting question and we're working on it, but not in time, we're doing it in space. Okay, thank you. Problem. 